Good morning. Um, my name is Scott Biggins. I'm the Chief of Hepatology and I have um, the great pleasure to be asked to introduce your speaker this morning, Dr. Kieran Bamba. Uh, Dr. Bamba did her medical school at uh, Tulane and uh, got a, a master's degree in physiology and biophysics at uh, the Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, she did her um, residency and internal medicine and uh, gastroenterology at the Mayo Clinic Rochester, where she also got a, a master's degree in clinical research. Um, and she uh, went on to more training at UCSF, where she got an advanced degree in um, uh, uh, transplant hepatology and uh, was part of the NIH-funded NASH clinical trials. Um, she was recruited at the University of Colorado, where she had a robust clinical trials group in liver um, uh, 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 clinical studies, particularly focusing on NASH. And then she was recruited here in January 2017 that brought her clinical trials unit that's part of the um, Center for uh, Liver Investigation Fostering Discovery. So, um, Dr. Karen Bamba, welcome. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to start by saying I took the liberty of changing the title of the talk to um, Metabolic Associated Fatty Liver Disease. And this is probably the most important take home from my talk is there's nomenclature change coming and it is long, long overdue. Um, we need to do away with the term non-alcoholic. It's a fraught term. It's been fraught from the beginning. It's fraught for providers and it's fraught for patients. It's clinically uninformative. It trivializes what is otherwise a pretty complex metabolic liver disorder and it implies ambivalence. And I've always felt like the name non-alcoholic conveyed a sense of nihilism in the practicing community towards these patients. And it's just plain stigmatizing. So there's a new lexicon developed. It's metabolic associated fatty liver disease or metabolic associated steatohepatitis, MAFLD or MASH. So these are my disclosures relevant to this talk. This is the outline of my talk. So I'll preface this by saying throughout this talk, I actually am going to use the phrasing NAFLD, NASH, and NAFL for consistency, and that's what's on a lot of the slides as well. Um, we'll talk about the epidemiology and natural history of NAFLD. I'll talk a little bit about the pathophysiology, specifically the lipotoxicity model. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about diagnosis and therapeutics. I'll show you some data pertaining to future trends in NAFLD, and I'll end with a few summary slides. So NAFLD is prevalent, prevalent. It's prevalent across the globe. It affects about 25% of individuals globally. In the US, it's about 24 to 25%, but there are parts of the world where the prevalence is upwards of 30%, like the Middle East and countries in South America. Interestingly, in Africa, the prevalence rates are a little bit lower, around 13%. So we have some specific terminology that we use when we talk about NAFLD, and I think sometimes this causes confusion. It's, it's actually confusing for patients. But we use the term NAFL to denote more of a simpler form of steatosis histology. So people have fat in their liver, but they don't have a lot of inflammation or ballooning it's not a lot of activity. And then we use the phrasing NASH, which is steatohepatitis. So it's fat with associated inflammation and ballooning. And it's a very active, potentially progressive liver disease. So among all comers with NAFLD, about 80% of those individuals will have NAFL. And among those individuals, it's probably the minority who progress over the years to cirrhosis. However, among NAFLD patients, about 20% can have NASH histology. And this is the more progressive form of NAFLD, because about 15 to 20% of these individuals can have progressive disease over their lifetime, and they're at risk for progressing to cirrhosis. 
So NAFLD certainly is clinically significant. It's associated with increased mortality. These are survival curves comparing mortality rates in NAFLD patients relative to what's expected in the general population. And NASH histology increases the mortality risk further. And what do these patients die from? They die from cancers, ischemic heart disease, and most notably liver disease, which is typically in the general population, ranks around 16 or 17 as cause of death, is elevated to the third leading cause of death in these patients. So it's important to think about who are your patients who are at risk for NASH. And actually, they're pretty readily identifiable with with uh, some basic clinical characteristics. It's the folks with type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance, people with central obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia. Maybe they have multiple features of metabolic syndrome. I think we all see a lot of patients with some, some conglomeration of these risk factors. Other important associations with NASH are polycystic ovarian syndrome obstructive sleep apnea, hypothyroidism, hypopituitarism, hypogonadism. And the more of these metabolic risk factors an individual accumulates, the higher their risk for having NASH. So that's a pretty, pretty e easy way to rapidly sort of risk stratify the patients you're seeing in clinic. So the challenge has been and continues to be for us that we currently lack a non-invasive test for steatohepatitis. NASH remains a liver biopsy-based diagnosis. But NAFLD is common, and it's estimated to affect about 80 million adults in the United States. And I just told you that we estimate the prevalence of NASH in NAFLD to be 20%. That's 16 million adults in the U.S. So we simply can't biopsy everyone. We don't want to, and it's not feasible. So the reality of that situation is that patients go undiagnosed all the time. We miss these diagnoses all the time. And from the hepatologist standpoint, the combination between not having a good test to test for NASH combined with lower provider awareness and low patient awareness about their risk for NASH results in us meeting these patients when they're very far along in their disease. It's not infrequent. We meet them once they've progressed to cirrhosis, and we're talking to them about NAFLD, and we hear them say, but I was told years ago I had fat in my liver. They told me it wasn't a problem. They told me not to worry about it. Or we meet them when they have decompensated cirrhosis and we're having to think about liver transplant for them. So it's really critical to try and identify who the individuals are at risk for progressive NASH. And right now, when we say progressive NASH, we're talking about NASH with fibrosis. Because fibrosis is important, but that's also the tool we have to test for. So in this context, I think this hierarchical model of NAFLD histology is useful. So it rank orders histologic lesions of NAFLD based on their clinical consequences. And not surprisingly, fibrosis is at the top of the tower. And fibrosis does indeed associate with important clinical outcomes. It's associated with increased risk for all-cause mortality with increasing fibrosis stage. It's associated with increased rates of liver-related liver mortality with sort of an exponential increase as patients reach more advanced stages of fibrosis. So, so the relevant question is then, who are the NAFLD patients who are at risk for hepatic fibrosis in your practice? Those are patients with obesity, central obesity especially, advancing age older than 45 to 50 diabetes or insulin resistance, hypertension, smoking, fructose intake has been very well described to be associated with NAFLD, fast food consumption or similar dietary indiscretions, and sedentary lifestyle, all easily identifiable in the clinic. So these risk factors, they're prevalent in our population. Obesity is prevalent. Diabetes is prevalent. 
So just to take these two risk factors as an example, if you take all comers with obesity, the prevalence of NAFLD in those individuals is 55 to 95 percent, depending on the population you're looking at. Within those individuals, 15 to 55 percent might have NASH histology. Type 2 diabetes, similar, very high prevalence of NAFLD, up to 80 percent. And NASH, very high prevalence of NASH within patients with type 2 diabetes, 20 to 80 percent. That's a lot of people. And then on top of that, you overlay that this population is at risk for developing advanced hepatic fibrosis. So there's a target population right there. Type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance, obesity, and advancing age. Those are patients who we need to think about. Do they have NAFLD? And if they do, do they have steatohepatitis? Do they have fibrosis? These are patients that we should probably be seeing in our liver clinics too. So fibrosis matters. It's a very important prognostic histologic feature. But what I want to emphasize, and this is an important take-home point, is that NASH histology matters. Steatohepatitis matters. But we talk about fibrosis much more because we can test for it easily. We can't test as easily for steatohepatitis. And testimony to the importance of the steatohepatitis is that the features like ballooning and inflammation they're predictive of fibrosis progression down the road. Increasing severity of steatohepatitis on a biopsy predicts fibrosis progression in the future. Even changes just in the fat in the liver associate with changes in NASH histology. So all the features of steatohepatitis are clinically relevant. So there was a time when we thought about NAFLD in a pretty straightforward fashion. We thought people developed steatosis in the liver, and then they progressed to NASH, and then they progressed to cirrhosis, and a pretty linear progression. We have more natural history data now, and we understand that NAFLD is a very dynamic disease. Patients with NAFLD can progress to NASH, but they can regress from NASH to NAFLD. Patients with NASH can progress to certain degrees of fibrosis. Maybe they regress a bit, or they progress to cirrhosis. Once they reach cirrhosis, they're at risk for liver cancer and hepatic decompensation. It's notable that the risk for liver cancer occurs not only in advanced fibrosis with NASH, but can also occur in non-cirrhotic NASH. And all of these transitions between these different states can be modified by factors like physical activity, dietary intake, a person's genetic makeup, change in their weight, insulin resistance, and advancing age. So I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit about NAFLD pathogenesis, and I'm going to emphasize the lipotoxicity model. This was first put forth in the hepatology community by Dr. Brent Tetri at St. Louis University, who really is one of the thought leaders in NAFLD. And in this model, free fatty acids are really thought to be the key in the pathogenesis of NAFLD. And free fatty acids can come from two main sources. They can come from dietary fats. They can come from dietary simple carbohydrates. So from simple carbohydrates like glucose and fructose can get metabolized to free fatty acids in the liver through this process called de novo lipogenesis. There are several key enzymes in that process. I'm highlighting a few of those here because some of these pathways are targets for future therapeutics in NAFLD. So de novo lipogenesis is a significant pathway for the production of free fatty acids in the liver. Dietary fats are a source of free fatty acids. They get stored as triglycerides, stored in adipose tissue around the body. In this context, maybe adipose tissue can be considered as sort of protective for us. It stores and prevents the excessive exposure of other organs to these free fatty acids. But when those adipocytes become hypertrophied with lipid, their gene expression patterns can change and they can resemble activated macrophages and they can produce more adipocytokines. And some of those cytokines can trigger inflammatory pathways that predispose towards adipose tissue insulin resistance that can engender the release of free fatty acids from the adipose into the circulation then that travels and gets deposited in other, other tissues like the liver. 
So the liver actually is equipped to manage these free fatty acids. It has two, at least two main disposal systems. The free fatty acids can be um, undergo mitochondrial beta oxidation, or they can be reesterified into triglycerides and then exported into the blood as VLDL. And we common, commonly see hypertriglyceridemia in our, among our patients with NAFLD. Or these reesterified triglycerides can be stored in lipid droplets in the liver. The problem is when the system gets overloaded with the free fatty acids, the disposal systems can't cope. And so those excess free fatty acids get diverted into generation of lipotoxic lipids. And it's these lipotoxic lipids that are associated with endoplasmic reticulum stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, hepatocellular injury, inflammatory activation, apoptosis. And all that leads to the NASH phenotype. And in this regard, I'm using the word phenotype deliberately. A lot of times we talk about NASH as a disease entity that has a cause and hopefully has a treatment. But really, like so many disorders in humans, it's a phenotype. It's an individual's manifestation of their own variations in metabolic processing, their own genetics, which we'll touch on in a little bit, their microbiome, their inflammatory and wound healing pathways and their own susceptibility to other insults like alcohol intake, physical inactivity, and dietary changes. And all those factors impact how an individual actually responds to the lipotoxic state. So when it comes to genetics of NAFLD, there are actually several genes that have been associated with NAFLD. In three large GWAS studies, it is the PNPLA3 single nucleotide polymorphism that's shown up in all three and that's the one I'm going to talk to you about. So PLA3 is also called adiponeutrin. It is a C to G transition. The phenotype is the MM phenotype. The prevalence of the PNPLA SNP is it's found globally. Um, the prevalence varies across the globe, and it varies in different populations. The variant allele is actually most common in Hispanic individuals. It has an intermediate frequency in Caucasians, and it has the lowest frequency among Africans and African Americans. So the exact role of PNPLA3 isn't fully sussed out yet. There's evidence to suggest that the variant PNPLA3 can abnormally accumulate on lipid droplets and somehow impairs lipid droplet metabolism. Hepatic stellate cells, which exist in the liver and are important for wound healing and fibrosis deposition in the liver, can also express the variant PNPLA3. And those hepatic stellate cells have greater expression of inflammatory cytokines, and they're vulnerable to more proliferation. And that sets up an environment for an, a fibrogenic phenotype of hepatic stellate cells. So the PNPLA3 SNP has um, clinical relevance. It does associate with NAFLD severity. It increases the risk of steatosis in the liver almost twofold. Specifically, individuals who are homozygous for the GG genotype have higher steatosis content in the liver than heterozygotes or wild type. It increases the risk for NASH histology two and a half fold. It increases the risk for fibrosis over threefold. And interestingly, the PNPLA3 SNP is associated with increased risk for liver cancer. And this may be part of the explanation for how some people who don't have cirrhosis in the setting of NAFLD also develop cancers. So these are some very recently published data um, from using NHANES. And uh, they identified individuals who likely had NAFLD within the NHANES database. And the interesting part of the study is that they genotyped them for the PNPLA3 SNP. And the most interesting part of the study is that they had over 20 years of follow-up. We don't have many large databases where we have that long duration of follow-up. And the interesting thing is that the variant 
um, MM phenotype associates with increased risk of liver mortality over the long term. I think a lot of us found this very, very intriguing. Um, I will just call your attention to the, the Y axis, which starts at 90. So that's not to imply that most of the people died by 20 years. So no talk about NAFLD pathogenesis would be complete without mentioning the gut microbiome. There's a very complex interaction between dysbiosis and NAFLD, and there's a lot of fascinating research out there. There's a lot to be discovered. This, this is a talk unto itself. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to explain it all to you, but, but just to say that dysbiosis sets up an environment where there's increased intestinal permeability, dysfunction of the tight junctions in the epithelial lining of the gut. It sets up an environment of a choline deficient state, which can contribute to inflammation in the liver. Bacterial location can trigger inflammatory pathways and apoptotic pathways. Dysbiosis contributes to the generation of short chain fatty acids that can contribute to steatosis. And dysbiosis alters bile acid metabolism that can then affect signaling like Farnesoid X receptor signaling, which we now have an appreciation is a bigger player in all liver disease than may have been previously appreciated. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, so a lot of interesting research on dysbiosis. It's certainly a factor in the pathogenesis and there's a lot of outstanding reviews out there if anybody's interested further. So moving on to diagnosis of NAFLD. I think a lot of us can appreciate that NAFLD is actually an incidental diagnosis most of the time. Uh, incidentally picked up hepatic steatosis on abdominal imaging that was done for other reasons, or patients noted to have elevated liver enzymes that are otherwise unexplained. And this is typically occurring in the context of patients who have metabolic risk factors. So a diagnosis of NAFLD discussion is not complete without talking about alcohol, because alcohol is prevalent in our population and alcohol is a major, major cause of hepatic steatosis. So for all these patients, when we think about is it metabolic associated fatty liver disease, an alcohol history is actually the, one of the first most important pieces of information to get out of these individuals. And it's not just, do you drink, yes or no? It is, it is how much do you drink? What was your recent drinking pattern? Longer term drinking pattern? A lot of information comes out if you dive a little bit deeper. So how much alcohol is too much alcohol? Some of the data would suggest that on average for women, more than one drink per day, and on average for men, more than two drinks per day. There are some <clears throat> people who work in the NAFLD world who would say it should be a little more liberal, not more than two drinks per day for women and not more than three drinks per day for men. So this is another important point. Liver enzymes are terrible biomarkers for NASH. They're terrible. The sensitivity is 45%. Might as well flip a coin. Um, it's important to note that about 30% of individuals who have biopsy-proven NASH have normal ALTs at the time of their biopsy. So we don't have good non-invasive markers for steatohepatitis, but we do have tests for hepatic fibrosis, and we talk about them a lot, and we use them a lot. So I'm going to mention two of the, the imaging tests, the transient elastography, or fiber scan, and MR elastography. So fiber scan is a very convenient, easy, fast, well-tolerated point-of-care test. We have fiber scan machines in our liver clinic here, at Harborview and at Northwest. It's a pretty straightforward test. The ultrasound transducer is positioned over the right lobe of the liver. A low frequency vibration is transmitted to the liver. It initiates a shear elastic wave and the velocity of that wave is measured and it's turned into a marker of liver stiffness, which we interpret as hepatic fibrosis. It's important to note that for Fiber scan measures, the readings can be confounded if the patient's not fasting for at least three hours, that can artificially raise the readings. They've been drinking alcohol, increases portal blood flow, can raise the readings. 
Um, so fiber scan actually can effectively distinguish mild to no fibrosis from more advanced fibrosis. It's not really super accurate for definitively staging people because you can see on this figure how the, the ranges overlap, for example, stage two to stage three. I don't think you can have much confidence if somebody had a 11 kilopascal reading, whether they had stage two or three, but it's especially useful at the ends of the spectrum. Magnetic resonance e elastography, similar conceptually to the fiber scan, it detects a propagating shear wave in the liver, and it's a pretty accurate measure of liver stiffness. And again, its, it's utility is similar to the fiber scan, probably most useful at the ends of the spectrum. I'm going to move on to um, NASH therapeutics. There are actually a lot of drugs out there, and I'm not going to torture you with endless slides of, of clinical trial results, but I'm going to highlight a couple things. Probably the greatest challenge right now to finding an effective therapy for metabolic-associated steatohepatitis is that the underlying pathogenesis isn't completely identified. And it's not a single disease like we talked about. It's a phenotype. So there's all these different pathways that are feeding into the phenotype and vary from individual to individual. However, when you think about what targets you might, you might try to aim for in treating NAFLD, this figure is actually pretty, pretty useful conceptually. There are drugs that can impact energy intake, alter a person's satiety, or maybe mechanically in, impact their intake, bariatric surgery. Drugs that target energy absorption, like sodium glucose co-transporters that result in renal glucose wasting. Drugs that target energy dissipation, try to increase the energy dissipation. There are many drugs in development that are targeting metabolic pathways in the liver, like the FXR agonists, like the pathways involved in de novo lipogenesis. Drugs that target mitochondrial beta oxidation, and importantly, drugs that target the, the injurious response, the endoplasmic reticulum stress, cell death pathways. And of course, fibrogenesis is an important target. Having said that, the cornerstone of management for all patients with NAFLD is weight loss and aerobic activity. And I think this, this scheme is pretty useful for having discussions with patients. It associates histologic improvement with degrees of weight loss, and I think it gives people sort of targets to aim for. Um, I will mention that some more recent data have come out to suggest that, that actually you can probably get more improvement in NASH histology with as little as 4% body weight loss. But this is still a useful, a useful target for patients. So bariatric surgery is effective for NASH. It improves the steatosis, it improves the inflammation, and in many studies, it improved or at least was neutral with respect to fibrosis progression. There are a few studies that showed that maybe there was a little progression of fibrosis after bariatric surgery. However, that fibrosis progression occurred early on with rapid weight loss and then stabilized. So the good news is that the pharmaceutical industry has turned its attention away from hepatitis C and is now targeting NASH. It's good for us and it's really good for our patients. And there's now well over 300 drugs in some degree of development currently. So more drugs than we can possibly talk about, but there are drugs out there in trials that are targeting all of these uh, pathways. So I'm just going to highlight two pathways and two drug studies. Um, the first one is the PIVINS trial, which was the first large-scale intervention treatment trial for biopsy-proven NASH patients, published now a decade ago. Looked at pioglitazone, high-dose vitamin E, or placebo. And the conclusion from this trial was that actually vitamin E compared with placebo was associated with a significantly higher rate of improvement in steatohepatitis. 43% of patients on high-dose vitamin E responded versus 19% of placebo. Pioglitazone was not associated with improvement in steatohepatitis. 
that actually was probably more a manifestation of just an unfortunate quirk of the trial randomization because subsequent studies have demonstrated that pioglitazone does actually improve all the features of steatohepatitis. Neither vitamin E nor pioglitazone improve hepatic fibrosis. The notable thing about pioglitazone and why, why I'm loath to recommend it to patients up front is because it causes weight gain and it's peripheral adipose weight gain. So in the Pivens trial, the average weight gain was 4.7 kilos, and that was very distressing for patients. And the weight gain did not regress when we stopped the drug. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the Farnesoid X receptor and FXR agonist. So FXR is a nuclear receptor that's a ligand activated transcription factor. It actually regulates a wide variety of processes in the body. It's involved in bile acid metabolism, lipid and glucose homeostasis, and regulation of immune responses. Activation of FXR has been shown to lower plasma triglycerides by repressing some of those enzymatic pathways in, in hepatic de novo lipogenesis. It can increase hepatic fatty acid oxidation. It can promote insulin resistance, decrease hepatic gluconeogenesis. It has a role in hepatocyte protection against bile acid cytotoxicity. That's part of the rationale for why it was developed and is now FDA approved for use in primary biliary cholangitis. It has anti-inflammatory effects on the liver and the vasculature, and it has antifibrotic effects. So all of these factors were strong rationales to investigate FX, FXR agonists in patients with NASH. And the first drug, first FXR agonist to be tested is a beta-cholic acid. So the first trial of a beta-cholic acid was called the FLINT trial. This came out in the Lancet in 2015. Patients were treat, treated with 72 weeks of a beta-cholic acid versus placebo. They looked at improvement in NASH as the primary outcome. And the FLINT trial was terminated early, but not for drug safety, but because it demonstrated such a significant efficacy. 45% of people in that beta-cholic acid group had improvement in their NASH histology versus 21% of placebo. But equally importantly, fibrosis improved. That's the first drug that showed improvement in fibrosis. 35% of patients on a beta-cholic acid had improvement in their fibrosis versus 19% on placebo. So interesting notes about a beta-cholic acid, it causes itching. And it causes itching in about 25% of patients. It's usually mild and easily managed is pretty infrequent that patients need to actually stop the drug because of itching. Other issues with the beta-cholic acid is it caused, caused a, a mild increase in LDL. Turns out that it peaked and then it came back down to normal during the study, but it was a signal that everybody was paying attention to. And HDL levels decreased a bit as well. So the conclusions from the Flint trial, a beta-cholic acid is superior to placebo in improving NASH. Beta-cholic acid is superior to placebo in improving fibrosis. Paritis is not infrequent in the beta-cholic acid, but it's uncommon that patients need to stop the drug because of itching. Uh, and importantly, during the 72-week trial, there was no difference in cardiovascular events between individuals on a beta-cholic acid and placebo. So these trial results have prompted um, the company to move forward with two phase three trials that are currently in progress, the REGENERATE trial in the REVERSE trial. The REGENERATE trials fully enrolled. These are adults with biopsy-proven NASH with stage one, two, or three fibrosis. And they had built into the plan uh, an interim analysis, the results of which just came out in December, and I'm gonna show you those. So the interim analysis shows that a beta-cholic acid met the endpoint of improving fibrosis in up to 23% of individuals on the drug. 12% of individuals on placebo had spontaneous improvement in fibrosis. However, a beta-cholic acid did not achieve the NASH resolution outcome, at least on the interim analysis. So the reverse trial is ongoing. This is looking at people with biopsy-proven NASH cirrhosis who are well compensated. Um, we'll anticipate data for that in the next couple of years. <clears throat> 
So a beta cholic acid is not the only FXR agonist out there. There are other FXR agonists in development and that are being tested in clinical trials that maybe have a different side effect profile than the beta cholic acid. So there are some promising drugs out there. Um, there's also been a lot of drug, drug failures as is intrinsic to the process. And part of the issue is, is as more trials are developed and fail, you learn from that process and realize how challenging it can be to design a proper clinical trial because NASH is a phenotype. And so it's probably not reasonable to include all comers with NASH in all trials. And there probably needs to be a more complex clinical trial design. So the future of NAFLD is a very important, much needed name change, metabolic associated fatty liver disease. I'm gonna be changing all my EPIC templates um, we really should be talking about a disease based on what it is and what it's not. The future of NAFLD looks young. The, this is the prevalence of obesity in the pediatric population. 20% of 12 to 19 year olds have obesity. 10% of two to five year olds have obesity. And if you look at NAFLD, the prevalence of NAFLD, 17% in, in teenagers, 38% in obese children, it's disturbing. And so we've, we've looked at some of, and modeled some of these trends with regards to liver transplant, but we've, we've entitled this the adipose wave effect, referring to the large number of younger obese individuals who are at risk for developing advanced fibrosis over the next two to three decades. This potentially has serious implications for our healthcare system. So there's actually a Markov model that was published a couple of years ago, sort of forecasting what the burden will be in 2030. And there will be an increase in NAFLD burden, maybe increasing by as much as 20% to over 100 million adults in the US projected to be up to a 60% increase in NASH burden to 27 million U.S. adults. But more importantly is the increase in fibrosis due to NASH. And most relevantly, the striking increase in the proportion with advanced fibrosis. So increase in advanced fibrosis means increased complications, projected to be an increase in decompensated cirrhotic patients we're seeing, NASH-related hepatocellular carcinoma, and liver-related deaths. So these are some of our modeling data looking at projections for a need for liver transplants. This is stratified by age group, but, but the point is it's a pretty steady increase in the number of people coming forward needing listing for liver transplant due to NASH cirrhosis. Same thing for NASH with hepatocellular carcinoma, a very striking increase. So in summary, MAFLD is a phenotype. It has very heterogeneous pathogenesis, variable natural history. I'll say, I don't know if the pediatric patients with obesity now, is their natural history gonna be the same as adults? Maybe, maybe not. Um, variable responses to therapy. I think we should expect that. So there's no FDA approved drug for NAFLD or NASH yet. That might be changing in the not too distant future, but I will tell you if a drug gets approved, it's gonna get approved for NASH. It's not gonna get approved for NAFLD, it's gonna get approved for biopsy proven NASH. Treatment response rates are pretty modest on the order of 20 to 30%. So there's still a lot of room for opportunity to develop more drugs. The response rate, the placebo response rate in these trials is actually pretty notable, 15 to 20% in some trials. So combination therapies are probably gonna be the way forward for finding treatments for NASH. So I wanna end by just uh, Advertising to you that we do have our, our NAFLD or metabolic fatty liver disease clinics. We're happy to see these patients. We have a clinic here on this campus, Harborview and Eastside. And if you have patients who might be interested in clinical trials or any other investigator initiated liver research, we're happy to, 
we're happy to hear from you or them. Thank you. Dr. Bomba, thank you so much. Questions? That was a fine talk. I uh, learned a lot. Um, I have two questions. Hopefully they're quite short and you can dispense with them quickly. The first is, could that placebo effect that you note, could that be, I mean, obviously there's just the benefit of getting into trials, but in fact, were these patients on placebo, like all the others advised to lose weight, exercise more, drink less, the, the usual things. And in a sense, maybe that really wasn't a placebo effect. Yeah, I think it's, it's fair to say um, that when patients enter into clinical trials, they get more attention. And so when they're sitting in the, the research exam room, we're talking to them about, about dietary modification and, and lifestyle. So that's, that's a potential issue. And then as a pulmonologist, uh, we're beginning to use some antifibrotic drugs for uh, particularly idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but it's being extended now to all types of pulmonary fibrosis. Are drugs such as profenadone and others being uh, tested in uh, MASH? I'm saying it right, I hope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, some of the, the, the antifibrotic drugs, um, I'm blanking on the name. I'm not familiar with that particular drug, but there was another study. I don't know if it was simtuzumab um, was being studied in pulmonary fibrosis as well. Um, that actually is one of the, the drugs that failed to show an effect in the liver disease, but... Yeah, there is some overlap there. Hi, thank you for um, this important talk. I was wondering, um, with the increasing rates of obesity, is there work being done on uh, changing the recommendations around screening or what we might be looking forward to uh, in that aspect? Yeah, I think that's, that's an excellent question. And it comes up periodically and, and uh, it gets talked around a lot. The, I think the Advocating for screening of, uh, you know, the population is a little challenging for several reasons, but, but screening the high risk individuals, and I know some individuals who are doing this vigorously, screening patients with type 2 diabetes and obesity, it's probably not unreasonable to, to screen those individuals, actually, and some clinical practices actually do that. So what happens to the liver after transplant? So I think what you're getting at is does, does MASH come back after transplant? And, and it does. It does come back in, after transplant probably in at least 30% of patients. And then on top of it, we give immunosuppressant drugs that were great for protecting the graft, but tacrolimus can predispose towards diabetes. We have them on steroids, which doesn't do anybody any help, so, so yes, it does come back. How the parameters are put in there, particularly around rising rates of alcohol consumption that we're seeing and whether the sort of interaction between those is included in your projections. So the, um, so the question is about the Mar details about the Markov modeling. That was actually done by the INOVA Fairfax group. Um, I would have to go back to the paper to look exactly at how they, they factored in alcohol. I just, I'll, I'll tell you, my, my personal impression is for a lot of the, the data out there using bigger databases, looking at NASH, undoubtedly that data is contaminated with, with alcohol patients. Because a lot of times if you try and suss out the alcohol history from a medical chart, you don't know. I have a quick question. Uh, I'm a radiologist, but most of, you know, um, what if there is a patient who comes to you right now with uh, MASH and uh, how do you, like, you know, I think the common prevalence in the general community seems to be that they seem to check for the enzymes and the fibro scan. I'm not sure how many people are aware of that, although do you think that is very well known? And then the second question is, if you diagnose MASH, what all do you offer at this point of time, like besides lifestyle modification? So, um, so as far as the awareness of FibroScan, I think that 
just kind of varies from practice to practice. The reason I put it in the talk was I wanted to make sure that everybody here knew that, that we have multiple fiber scan machines on this campus. I know that the endocrinology, the diabetes clinic here is, is entertaining incorporating fiber scan into their practice. So, so if, if a practice has an availability of fiber scan that gives a measure not only of fibrosis but also steatosis, um, that would be probably one of the better screening tools we have right now. There are some non-invasive blood biomarkers that have so-so performance that you can use to, to get at a person's risk for having fatty liver fibrosis as well. That's another means. Um, if there are concern, you could do, you could do an ultrasound probably detect, detect some degree of steatosis there. Um, and then your, your other question was, what do you do about when, when you diagnose NASH? Um, so, so I actually, I actually am a, am a believer in educating patients. I think there's just an enormous amount of value to sitting down to people and educating them. And so I talk to them about what it is that it's progressive and really spend time talking to them about the value of lifestyle interventions. And then I, I inform them about all these new drugs that are in development, some of which aren't just improving steatosis and inflammation, but also fibrosis. And so I encourage people to consider a clinical trial. If for some reason they don't qualify for a trial or they're not interested in a trial, then I might think about vitamin E with all the caveats that go along with that. Kind of along the same lines, you mentioned a lot of um, NAFO being diagnosed incidentally on a lot of imaging. What would you tell primary care providers who ha has a patient coming into clinic who has this incidental finding? And what should they do outside of lifestyle modifications? Should they be thinking about a fibro scan or referral to hepatology for a one-time discussion? Um, I would, a, a couple thoughts on that, because I imagine this comes up all the time. <laughs> And, and a question that always comes up is like, so you want us to send you everybody in our practice? Um, and that's, a, that's where I think the sort of, sort of the risk stratification becomes important is, is how many other metabolic risk factors do they have? If, it's, if it looks like it's cumulative, like they're obese and diabetic and have dyslipidemia, maybe those are people you actually refer to hepatology clinic. Like I see people like that all the time in fatty liver clinic and I'm, I'm happy to see them. Um, but, but I think also from the primary provider standpoint is, is educating those people because I, I really, I can't tell you guys how many times I've had the same conversation with patients is like, why didn't every, anybody tell me if they told me it, it wasn't a problem? I mean, how do I respond to that? I actually don't, don't respond to that, but, but, you know, you know, but, but, but I'm like, oh, well, if maybe, maybe the nihilistic approach is like, well, you know, everybody's told them to lose weight. They're not going to do anything. But there's actually a subset of people, and I've seen it, there's a subset of people that do. They do respond to the education, and they do take to heart, like, oh, my gosh, I have a liver problem? That's terrifying to some people. All right, let's give one more round of applause. Thank you.